2 Thessalonians. And um, don't, don't get di- too disturbed about what I, my text. It's not like I'm coming before you with an oral rebuke this morning, so I will have some admonitions, but, but this is not, uh, my purpose in reading this particular scripture is not to fuss at you. Is that okay? Uh, just wanted to say that up front because it will sound that way it very very possible could be taken wrong up front and I don't want you to do that <laughs> amen second Thessalonians chapter 3 let's go down to verse 6 now we command you brethren in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ now you can't get any stronger than that I mean he is the apostle is is putting the heaviest language he can to get your attention that ye withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. You see what I'm saying? I could, I, I could take that and I could pull out the whip and I could go fussing about everybody that I don't like. Okay? But that's not my point. But I, I do want to call your attention to the ability to the fact that he said, withdraw yourself. And I want to put a title on it today and talk about breaking the chain. Breaking the chain. And uh, let's pray together. I feel the Spirit of the Lord. And I want there to be a ministering spirit in this house. I want the Lord to do some good. In Jesus' name, Master, I love these precious people that you have called me to pastor. I pray for their help, their strength, their knowledge in the things of God, that they would grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you would help us as we search after you, that we search after you with a pure heart. God, don't let it be just just rote. Don't let it be just habits that we do. Don't let us have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. We want the blessings of God upon everything that we do. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone shout amen. Amen. God bless you, and you may be seated. You know that one of the greatest joys that I have on a Sunday morning is slipping away at the first of the service, going back there, being with the Sunday school kids. And um, so, Brother Richard, I was in the class where your wife and... and, um, and Tanya, Brother Jose's wife, teaches, and they've got wooden blocks scattered out there on the floor. And, and so one day I went in there, and they were taking those wooden blocks, and they do different things with them, and play Jenga, is that what you call it, where you stack them up and you pull them out one at a time and all that stuff. But this time they were stacking them on end like a bunch of dominoes. And... Um, they, they would stack them up, and then they'd just knock them down. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I just never had seen little kids like that do something like that, and it was just it was so fun. Uh, this particular thing is called the domino effect, not because you play dominoes like you're supposed to play dominoes, but you play dominoes with dominoes just to knock them down. I guess there's a little bully in all of us, you know, just like to see everything get knocked down. So the domino effect or a chain reaction is the, is the result of uh, one event that sets off a chain of other events. One of the fascinating ones that caught my attention was a bricklayer that was putting a cap on the top of a retaining wall. And he had all these bricks stacked up on, on end and he pushed the first one. And they all went, and, uh, and then when it got down to the very end, the very last one scooted just a little bit further, and then they all rippled back down and sat exactly in place. Now, that had to be fun. It's probably more work than it was worth setting it all up, but it had to be absolutely fun in doing something like that. It becomes very compulsive watching this domino effect in action. 
Because what they will do is they will literally set up whole rooms with, with magnificent uh, works of art where they have spent weeks putting together every little tiny piece only to knock them down in just a moment. Film the thing, get it over with. And uh, so hours of labor are gone just like that. Now, that's probably very fun to do as long as you're the one that gets to knock down your own stuff. Y'all with me? But too often life is more like that bully that once you get everything in your life in order like you want it to be, they knock it down for you. And you get, you get your life in place. Now, melancholy people, uh, those of you that have got the soul of a musician, the soul of an artist, those of you that have a lot of, of emotions in your life, you, you, as long as you are putting things in order, you got your life in order, you're a very happy person. But then life loves to knock your feet out from underneath you. And it's not long until you're flat on your face and you're going into depression because your world is one more time in a mess. Can I hear an amen? It's just the way life is. Now, I'm going to show you another picture. And this actually, this picture was what actually started my brain thinking on this process. This picture that I'm about to show you here was used in the nation of Greece for the express purpose uh, to propagate the propaganda, the information of the necessity of social distancing so that the nation in Greece would try to get it, the, the, the news out there that you can stop the spread of COVID just by pulling yourself away. And this, there, there's absolute truth to this. There's, there's wisdom to it. As much as I hate to do it, as much as it is totally against everything ingrained inside of me, I have at times had to tell the congregation, we're not having service today. You don't know how that hurts me as a pastor because my greatest joy is watching the Holy Ghost move through a sanctuary, people ministered to, people being blessed, people being helped, and, and all of those things. But yet I do understand if you're sick, I don't want you here because I don't want the whole church to get sick. I, I don't want the, the, the fire of viruses to, to burn through. And so... It, it's, it's good, I, but, but there is wisdom to it. I feel like I'm right back to where I was at Wednesday night when I was talking about the doctrine of separation. It is important, folks, because we don't want the spiritual viruses of this world. Sin, sin operates just like a virus. The Bible gives the typology of sin being like leprosy, and lepers have to isolate themselves. Come on, somebody. Have to pull away. Why? Because during those days, leprosy was so highly contagious, and it was like getting the news that you were terminally ill and you were going to die. That's not the kind of information you want. It's, it was like COVID on steroids. It's one of the worst things because it's not just a little lingering cough and you get over with it eventually. The thing about, about leprosy was it affected your nerves. And the longer you lived with it, the worse it got. And the more it affected your nerves, the less you could feel pain. The less you felt pain, the more you ended up injuring yourself. The more you injured yourself, the more you had wounds that you were unaware of. And they ended up getting gangrenous, and you began to lose limbs. Let me just remind you about something, folks. Sin is nothing to play with because sin doesn't just stop with a temptation. But when it is finished, 
That's the thing that we watch out about sin. So what do we do? We have to withdraw ourselves from some of those things. We don't get involved in that kind of life. We move away from them. Is it okay if I just go ahead and hit a little bit of Wednesday night? Folks, there's a, there's a good reason you don't go to the bar to drink a Pepsi. You don't, you don't go inside of that atmosphere. Yes, Jesus did eat with sinners, but I'll promise you he had greater influence upon the sinners than the sinners ever did with him. And I'll promise you that he set the atmosphere and not let the sinners set the atmosphere. Now, so that's kind of the obvious connection to, to social distancing, but, but let me explore something further than all of that. Because the thing that I want to focus on today is I want to talk to you about breaking the chain of abuses that have come to you in the past. Generational curses that seems to have haunted you ever since you were a child. Have you ever said something and uh, in saying it, here? In those words, the echoes of one of your parents, either your mom or your dad, and you begin to realize they live through you. You become your parent. You actually become the very thing that, that you said when you was 18 that you'd never be. Can I get a witness? All of that, whether it's good or bad, whether you say some things and it's nice, all of that's good as long as your parent was a perfect parent. And thank God for those that have raised their children in the faith. And, and there is that positive uh, effect that has been all of there. And, and they're the models that you can set up and say, uh, we want to be like that. But the fact of the matter is, not many of us were raised like that. Especially if you were not raised in the church. If you weren't raised in the church, it's very probable that you were raised in dysfunction and dysfunction hurt you. I feel a push of the Holy Ghost this morning. I feel a nudge of the Holy Ghost this morning because I, I want to I tell some of you that God loved you enough that he didn't look at your situation. He didn't look at your, 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 your life and say they're, they're too bad to reach. God delights in bad cases. God delights in rescuing people that the world looks at and says, I can't do anything with. God loves that. He loves to turn the demonic. De, 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 uh, the, the demonic of gatherings. He loves to help the one that is, is, is about to be uh, slain because of the adultery. He loves to reach the one that is past help. He just delights in hard cases. And I'm glad that he does. Somebody shout amen. amen. Have you ever noticed our kids catch all of our bad traits and not enough of our good traits. Even though it's unintentional. Let me tell you what we do. We pass on the very same hurts that hurt us. Justifying. That's just the way that I am. That's just the way that I was raised. I, I'm just telling it like I see it. You need to go to a spiritual optometrist is what you need to do. You, you justify it. Well, that's just my Irish temper. He shouldn't push me. Uh, it's my German attitude. It's my Hispanic. Don't make me go there now. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You can blame it on culture. You can blame it on whatever you want to. The fact of the matter is, it's not because your mama whipped you when you was a kid and you wet the bed. It's because you don't allow yourself to be put under the microscope of God and God to work on some things and to pull it out of who you are. 
You cannot put a band-aid on some issues. You've got to face it and deal with it and, and confront that thing. All right, I'm fixing to feel the Holy Ghost in this camp. Esau and Jacob had an issue. Jacob had a, a nature, a spirit, a conniving nature. You say, but God hated Esau and he loved Jacob. Yes, he did. But that didn't mean he's going to leave Jacob like he is. That does not mean he excuses the junk that is in Jacob's life. God still has got to pull some things out of Jacob. And I preached about it just the other day. He got into that time where he wrestled with the angel. And he asked him, what is your name? Because there comes a time you've got to confront your own nature. And you've got to confess and admit, this is who I am. This is what I've done. This is what I've been since I was little. And I am passing on generational curses. Uh, do you, I don't, uh, just, let me just ask you, do you want me to get real with you this morning? Or do you want me to just leave you in the mess that you're in? You, 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 want, you want out of it? You want help? Now today, sitting in church, you're feeling sanctified. Everything's all right. But I'm talking about the time when that man pushes your button. I'm talking about that time where it just you've had a bad day and all of a sudden stuff comes out of your spirit and you, you feel like uh, once it's over with, like you're a dog, like you're back on, uh, you, you know, you know you, I know better than this. Why did I do such a thing like that? I'm trying to tell you that there is a way out and you don't have to hurt people just because you were hurt. You don't have to pass it on and, and let them feel the abuses that you felt. I am telling you something that I know. Someone posted the other day uh, about the, the, the joy of being raised in a family that every time they said goodbye, they said, I love you. Now, I love you is not goodbye. It's not see you later. It, it's something totally different. But I'm going to tell you something. I'd rather be told I love you if I never see them again. I can say the last words that I ever heard from them was. And they said, it's so nice, you know. They, they hug one another and they'd say, I love you. And they'd hang up before they hang up the phone, I love you. And I responded, I said, I was not raised that way. But my sons were. I was driving down 101 when I was 19, 20 years old. Dad was sitting in the passenger seat. Uh, I don't know why he allowed me to do that. Uh, it was his car. And, but we were driving down 101. We were going around Salinas. And I looked over to Dad and I said, Dad, I love you. And he looked at me and hesitated and said, what do you want? Now, I'm talking about a dad that was a United Pentecostal Church preacher. I'm talking about a father that was, he had gotten the Holy Ghost when he was a young man and began to preach, went and left his, his family and went into the work with the Indians. He did all of those kind of things, but yet he could not communicate love to his family. There was an issue that was being passed on from generation to generation. And yes, we were a bunch of old Germans. And I don't know how much of that got brought over from Germany before the turn of the century. I don't know. But I do know that my grandmother had an issue with jealousy. Deep, deep jealousy. I guess it's because when you live with a Bodhi, you know, I, I mean, they're, they're so way up here that. She was so highly jealous of my grandfather, wouldn't, couldn't stand him being around a woman. 
and uh, just couldn't handle that kind of stuff. She isolated herself a lot. And I, I, all I knew about my grandfather was my grandfather left my grandmother, divorced her, and went out there and shacked up with a woman for his last 17 years. And he died when he was 64 years old. That's about all I know about my grandfather. And I think about, I think about those things. And then, then later I got around an old lady named Sister Chenault in Oklahoma. And she said, I remember when your grandfather used to preach. And I thought, what? You, you're talking about, I knew my grandfather, grandmother had gotten the Holy Ghost under C.P. Kilgore. I knew those kind of things. But, but all I knew was my grandfather backslid. He backslid because when my mother's sister came over to see her sister and she wasn't there, granddad talked to her through the screen in porch door and grandmother got it in her mind that grandfather was flirting and having an affair with this woman and that mental image began to build in her mind until she finally took his clothes threw him out the door and locked him out and said leave and don't come back did he do it no he didn't do it he was not guilty. He was being friendly, but he was not guilty of the infidelity that she was accusing him. But he finally said, I might, he, he stayed faithful for many years and then finally said, I might as well because she thinks that I have. And he was pushed to it by a spirit of jealousy. And then I was raised in a home where I remember my father reminding my mother that one of her dates later became a pastor of a Trinitarian Assemblies of God church down in L.A. that was called the Glass Cathedral. You ever heard of that? And it brought it up, and you could see Mother's uncomfortableness of it. And he brought it up, and he brought it up, and he brought it up. And I watched that jealousy as I was a young man, and I thought to myself, I don't want to live that way. I don't want to live where I am suspicious. I don't want to live where I put pressure on my spouse. I don't want to live in that kind of a way. So what do you do about it? You do what Jacob did. There comes a time that you have to confront your past, and you have to come to it face to face and say, I refuse to let my past become my future. I am not going to let this thing keep going on. I am going to pull myself away from this thing and I am going to break the chain of the curses that have been going on in my home from generation to to generation. I'm not preaching to the children right now. I'm preaching to adults. I'm preaching to people that your daddy was an alcoholic, but that doesn't mean you've got to be an alcoholic. I'm preaching to people that you've made, your, your, your parents made some horrible mistakes. But I am telling you, you don't have to do the same things that they do. But there is a lion accusing devil that will try to smooth talk you into believing you're no better than they are. I may not be better. But I am responsible upon building on the foundation that was given to me. And I don't have to go and repeat mistake after mistake after mistake. Begins to talk to you. You're never going to amount to anything. You're just like your daddy. Now honestly, I don't, I don't want you to raise your hand, but how many in this building have struggled with the same kind of emotion? The devil has said, you're just like your mama. You're just like your aunt, whatever. You're just like so-and-so. You're, you're going to do the same kind of thing. You made the same mistake they are, and it just runs in the family. I got news for you. 
There's another family that I have been born to, and that is the family of God. And I... Somebody help me preach in this house. He goes and tells you the apple doesn't far, fall far from the tree. You ever heard that kind of junk? And then they say especially the rotten fruit. Well, let me tell you something. Even rotten fruit have seeds inside of it that can produce some good things. And don't try to tell me I don't have potential. Because if I die, there's going to come a resurrection. I feel like preaching in this house. I'm telling you I'm not going to pass on the junk from yesterday. I'm going to let it loose. I'm going to confront it. I'm going to call it what it is. And I am not going to relive. Just because your past wasn't perfect doesn't mean you're destined to repeat those mistakes. I hate the attitude of the AA. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Hi, I'm Tom. I'm an alcoholic. Let me tell you something. My name's Ron. I've been born of the blood and the water. I've been born again. I've been washed in his blood, sanctified by his spirit. I'm not what I was. I may not be all I'm going to be, but God's not finished with me yet. God's, uh, God's still working on me. I'm still on the potter's wheel. And as long as I'm on the potter's wheel, somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, when, am I, when, am I, when do I get off the potter's wheel? When he's finished with you and wants to put you on the shelf. What that means, as long as I've got breath in my body, God is able to work on me. Let's, let's, let's go to the word of the Lord. Let's go to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel, is this all right? Chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18, begin reading for me so I can take my glasses off and just preach. Read in chapter 18 and go ahead and just start with verse 1. I should have gave it to him up front. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying. The word of the Lord came unto me. This is just about like the apostle saying that, that what I'm giving you is from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about as straight as you can get. The Lord spoke. Read. What mean ye that you use this proverb? What do you mean when you use this proverb? Concerning the land of Israel. Concerning the land of Israel. Now, when he says the land of Israel, he's not talking about the soil. He's not talking about the, 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 uh, uh, the, the help me out, uh, Becky's. Uh, you're into horticulture right now. He's not talking about all that agricultural possibilities. Read for me. Saying the He's fathers, talking about the people. Read. The fathers have eaten sour grapes. The fathers have eaten sour grapes. And the children's teeth are and set on edge. And the children's teeth are on edge. What do you mean when you use that analogy. You're going back and you're using a proverb. What do you mean when you use that? I'm speaking of Israel, let me tell you what it meant. The proverb meant the wild grapes that the elders ate were the sins that they committed. The, 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 when, the, when the proverb said their teeth are on edge. Now, there's, uh, there's been a few sour apples I've gotten into. There's been a few fruit that I've bitten into that was not right, right. and it's not pleasant. Somebody help me preach. Right. But what he's saying is, it's so good, I'm going to slap your mama, and it's going to be felt through her grandchildren. <laughs> you all understand what I'm talking about? They bit into sour grapes and it set the children's teeth on edge. The consequences of their sin was affecting the next generation. He says, what do you mean using this proverb? Read on for me. As I live, saith the Lord God, you shall not... Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Just stop right there. Time out. 
Let, 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 in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. This that God dealt with Israel about in the book of, of Ezekiel was also used in the book of Jeremiah. You're talking about contemporary prophets. Oh, yeah. You're talking about God speaking to more than one man at the same time. Because in Jeremiah chapter 31, he deals with the very same thing. The very same proverb. So obviously, it was popular around Israel. And God said, I'm sick and tired of hearing about it. I'm sick and tired of hearing that his issues are his kids' issues. I'm sick and tired of saying it's just going to go down that way. Adam Clark, one of the commentators that I check out, he, he refers it to these questions. Uh, he said, how far can the moral evil of the parent be extended to his offspring? Daddy was wrong. Granddaddy was wrong. How far is that going to reach? I'm going to tell you how far it is. As long as you continue to do what daddy did, that's how long it's going to be. But somewhere along the place, you've got to have somebody that will stand up and say, right here, this is going to change. Right. Question number two. Are the faults and the evil propensities of the parents not only transferred to the children, but the children are punished in them. How many of you believe that because you made a little mistake, that your kids are paying a price for it? Some of you need to be relieved of some guilt that because you, you did some things that was imperfect, that's why your children did something like that. Just hang on. Just hang on. I'm going to talk to you in the Holy Ghost because there's some of you that have got deep wounds in your spirit that you feel like it's because you didn't do this and you didn't do that and you didn't do all of that kind of stuff. I want to tell you that God wants to open up the wound in your spirit and pour in the oil and the wine and help you heal over some things. Number three, do the parents transfer their evil nature and are their children punished for their offenses? Is that what's going on? You're not good enough. You're not perfect enough. And there's not one single person in this room who is. There is not one. Not one. There was only, only one sing, uh, sinless individual and we crucified him. You say, no, the Jews did it. No, it was your sins that did it just as much. Now go back to chapter, chapter 18 and verse 3. Read verse 3 for me. As I live, saith the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord. Now the last time I checked, he is from everlasting to everlasting. He is the ancient of days, and he's the promise of our tomorrow. He's the first and the last, the one that was, is, and will be. He is God, and there is no time on him. But he said, as long as I live, read. You shall not have an occasion. You're not going to have an occasion anymore. Anymore to use this proverb. I in feel Israel. like shouting right now. Yeah. You're not going to have an occasion to use this proverb anymore in Israel. This proverb may fit the broad spectrum of the world out there, but those who've got a relationship with God. As, 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 as I live, saith the Lord, you're not going to have an occasion anymore to use this proverb in Israel because when you've got a walk with God and a relationship to God, you are not bound to the common wisdom of this world. This world's wisdom is still sensual, but I want you to know His ways are above our ways. Hallelujah! I'm telling you, uh, you need to get wisdom that is from above, uh, and the wisdom that is from above uh, says as long as there's a God that lives, uh, you've got hope. Yes. Woo! Let me go back to the Ten Commandments. Is that basic enough? 
I take you back so often into the first two or three chapters of the book of Genesis. Uh, but listen to me out of Exodus chapter 20 as I talk about the things uh, in the Ten Commandments. What is the first commandment? You're going to love the Lord your God. What's the second commandment? Don't have any idols. Exodus 20, verse 5. Verse 4 talks about don't, don't set up any graven images. Verse 5, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, that's those idols, nor serve them, for I the Lord am a, uh, thy God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the third and fourth generation. Pastor, I thought you just said, I thought you were just building up to the fact that they don't have to do it. Well, just don't stop reading yet. You got to finish the verse. Passing on, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Oh, I feel like shouting. Verse 6, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Oh, come on, somebody, and shout unto the Lord. What makes the difference uh, between the curse and the blessing? Uh, it's when somebody falls in love with God and gets consumed uh, with the things of God. That's when the blessings. My kids don't have to be cursed because of things that happen to me. My grandchildren don't have to bear the issues. Uh, they may have had some things uh, that were, were per imperfect before. I don't have to pass on dysfunction. I don't have to pass on pain. Uh, I can pass on the blessings of Almighty God. Now, go back to Exodus, uh, to, to Ezekiel 18. Go to verse 4. Read verse 4. Is this all right? Read for me. Behold, all souls are all mine. All souls are mine. Read. As the soul of the Father. As the soul of the Father. So also the soul of the Son so is mine. So also is the soul of the Son mine. Read. The soul that sinneth. The soul that sinneth. It shall die. It shall die. It's not about daddy made mistakes so the boys were cursed. It's the one that sins. Now, now if, you, if you take the time, go home and read Exodus, uh, Ezekiel chapter 18. He goes through scenarios in there, several scenarios, where it talks about if the father's a devil. If it, the father's a moral bankrupt and the son says, I'm not going to live that way. And he said, I'm going to live for God. God said his father's sins are not going to be visited upon him. Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. I'm looking at some of you, and there's some things that your parents did that I know of that, that, that you have haunted you through the years, that, that, that you feel like that, that because of that it has affected you. Let me tell you something, friend. You can, as long as it affects you, to run to the feet of Jesus and say, Jesus, I, I, I'm weak and I need you. You can break the chain that has been put upon you. Hallelujah. One righteous man can break the chain of generational curses. One righteous woman can break the chain of all those things. So I challenge you today to start a new family tradition. One of blessings instead of pains. One of good things instead of hurtful things. Paul, Paul spoke to Timothy, his protege in the gospel, and he said, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and their, thy mother Eunice also, uh, he said, And I am fully persuaded it's in you as well. <laughs> yeah, 
things can be passed down. But if you want to, pass down blessings instead of curses. Oh, come on, throw your hands up in the air. Worship the Lord. Woo! Glory! But hang on for just a minute. Because the opposite is true as well. All it takes is one generation to pull away and stop fires of Holy Ghost revival. And all the blessings that have been handed down from generation to generation can stop because one person doesn't keep the fire. The scripture said he has a two-edged sword. In his hands, it cuts both ways. It is not just the fact that you can be delivered, but if you're going to be so callous and un- unconsciousness of the goodness that God has dealt to you, all the good works of faithful men of old can come down upon your generation. And you pulling away from the things of God. A friend of mine pastors now down in, in the San Diego area. I met him as a young preacher back in Mississippi. He wrote a poem one day. He said, Daddy doesn't go to the altar anymore. He said he still puts an envelope in the plate when it comes around. Seems to like all the new music, never complains about the sound. Still claps during the songs, but he sits closer to the back door. And Daddy doesn't go to the altar anymore. He smiles and he greets folks, shakes a hand of somebody across the aisle, says amen during the sermon, and the pastor's jokes make him smile. We still go to church every Sunday, just like before. But daddy doesn't go to the altar anymore. During the sermon, he used to be the loudest one, the first on his feet. He'd tell us kids that the word was our spiritual meat. But yesterday, during the preaching, his eyes were heavy. And I thought I heard him snore. And daddy doesn't go to the altar anymore. Last Sunday... Mom took us kids to church without him, saying she she says he wasn't feeling good, but when we got home, he was listening to music and had cooked our favorite food. Up until today, no one took a bite until Daddy prayed. No grace this time. He just started eating, unlike I'd ever seen before. Things sure have changed since daddy doesn't go to the altar anymore. I overheard him tell mama, out of life he wanted more. So he took a part-time job every Sunday, goes in early to open the store. Mama cries a lot in church now, and daddy doesn't go to the altar anymore. There's both healing and admonition in this house this morning. There's healing for some of you that have had those heavy, heavy things upon you. But I'm here to tell some of you, you need to fall back in love with the altar. You need to fall in love with a place that says, God, don't let me ever forget what you've done for me. And don't let the fire ever go out. I'm pleading with some of you. When I first came to Calvary, it seemed like every one of you sat real close to the front. 
And it seemed like I've tried to pull and pull and pull to get some of you to clo get closer to the front. Because one, one pew at a time, I'm pleading with you to find a place at the altar and beg, God, don't let my coldness curse my kids. Don't, don't let me be the one that puts upon them more than they can bear. I'm preaching to you today. Daddy, I'm preaching to you. Mama, you've got such an influence on those kids. I'm preaching to you. I'm preaching to you, sir. Because you know what you ought to be doing. I'm begging you, break the chain today. Don't, don't keep doing things you know is not right. Go to an altar. Get some things fixed today. I, come on, pray aloud. Don't don't just sit there and hide it. Don't 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 reserve yourself. Don't try to act like everything's fine. Today's the day when we need to cry aloud. I need you, Jesus. I need your mercy. I love you, God. I love you, God. Come on, pour out your soul. Pour out your soul. Ask Him for the oil and the wine. Ask Him for healing and help. Ask Him for the boldness to confront some things. Ask Him for that total transformation.
So one more time, your So 